This week on Vaticano, join us for a special feature on the Vatican's engagement with artificial intelligence. Get a sneak peek at the upcoming Jubilee of Hope and take an in-depth look at the Holy See and the Chair of St. Peter. Vaticano starts now. In tuo aiuto, Signore Dio nostro, ci renda sempre lieti nel tuo servizio. Pope Francis celebrated the 8th World Day of the Poor on Sunday, November the 18th. The theme for this year is The Prayer of the Poor Rises Up to God. This theme comes from the Book of Sirach. Pope Francis believes this scripture isn't well known and deserves more attention because of its rich themes. In his message for the World Day of the Poor, the Holy Father reminds us that the poor hold a privileged place in God's heart. He encourages everyone to learn how to pray for the poor and to join them in prayer, approaching with humility and trust. Pope Francis also criticizes policies that promote war and highlights the example of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who dedicated her life to helping the poor. She described herself as, quote, only a poor sister who prays. The celebration in Rome includes several powerful gestures of solidarity, like a shared meal with about 1,300 guests, many of them from the streets, in the Paul VI Hall, highlighting the importance of real, concrete acts of charity. The Vatican has also organized a special concert for the poor, featuring the music of the world-famous composer Hans Zimmer, set to take place on December the 7th. The Archbasilica of St. John Lateran Rome's most important church recently celebrated its 1,700th anniversary. As the Cathedral of the Diocese of Rome and the Pope's seat, it holds a central place in the Catholic Church. Since 1565, the Catholic Church has commemorated its dedication as a feast day, honoring its status as the mother and head of all churches of the city and the world. Built after the Emperor Constantine's Edict of Milan in 313, which granted Christians religious freedom, the Basilica was dedicated by Pope Sylvester I on November the 9th, 324. Though St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist became its patrons in the 6th century, it is called St. John Lateran because it was constructed on land donated by the Laterani family. To celebrate the 1,700th anniversary, the Diocese of Rome hosted a year of festivities, including concerts, masses, and historical talks. The Jubilee concludes with a mass celebrated by the diocese's vicar general. Hello and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. The bells of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris rang for the first time since a devastating fire damaged its spire and roof in April 2019. This milestone comes just a month before the cathedral's anticipated reopening on December the 8th. Pope Francis called the reopening a powerful and prophetic sign from the Lord in a message to French bishops. To mark the 150th anniversary of the arrival of the image of Our Lady of the Rosary in Pompeii on November the 13th, Pope Francis urged Catholics to reflect on Christ's life through the gaze of Mary, as he said, during the 2025 Jubilee Year of Hope. It is providential, the Pope said, that the Jubilee of Our Lady of Pompeii coincides with the upcoming Jubilee Year focused on Jesus, our hope. The Pope wrote this to the Archbishop Tommaso Caputo of Pompeii. Pope Francis announced that St. Isaac of Nineveh, a 7th century Assyrian bishop honored across Christian traditions, will be added to the Roman Martyrology. The announcement came during a November 9th meeting at the Vatican with Mar Awa III, Catholicus Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, marking 30 years since the Common Christological Declaration ended a 1,500-year dispute, and 40 years since the first meeting between a pope and an Assyrian Patriarch. Catholic leaders in Singapore are calling for prayers after a priest was stabbed during Mass. 
Father Christopher Lee, parish priest of St. Joseph Church in Bukit Timah, was attacked by a knife-wielding man during Saturday evening Mass on November the 9th. Pope Francis visited Singapore in September as part of a pastoral tour of Southeast Asia. The Archdiocese of Singapore serves a Catholic community of 395,000 faithful. Chiara Poro, Australia's ambassador to the Holy See since September 2020, has announced her departure. Born in Milan, Poro left Italy at age three and previously served in India and New Caledonia. The date of her departure and her successor have yet to be announced. Thank you again for watching this week's Vaticano Updates in Rome. Andreas Tonhauser for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, we'll return with a special feature on the Vatican and artificial intelligence here on Vaticano. AI is such an emerging technology, it's really changing almost week to week. And media companies are, I think, grappling, you know, we included, with how to best leverage this, this technology. When we speak about technological discourse, new technologies, what does the church have to offer there? I think that the church has a perspective on, you know, ethics, morality, things like that. It's really grounded in something that's real and true. And that's the foundation for any real good discourse about technology. It's a new, very powerful tool for both for students and for, uh, for faculty to teach and also for research. At an educational level, it's also informing the, the landscape of this technology's impact on the culture. Hidden away, deep inside the Vatican Gardens, there's a beautiful old palazzo with a sophisticated meeting space. A perfect place to convene the brightest minds to discuss the scientific trends shaping tomorrow. In October, the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences hosted a conference on artificial intelligence. Matthew Sanders and Cardinal Peter Turkson invited experts from a variety of fields to discuss the impact AI and other new technologies will have on the church and society. One thing that we're really trying to encourage is, is a new generation um, of philosopher and theologian who understands emerging technology like AI, its impact on the world and how it should be effectively used and not used. What I'm hoping to do is create more of an active dialogue where we can figure out what are the pain points uh, for Catholics right now um, and how can AI and emerging technology help address those. I think that the, the Holy See in particular has surrounded it as itself with incredible advisors in AI. There were many topics discussed, but participants primarily focused on three, which regularly came up during the discussions. Communication, education, evangelization. AI will change the way we communicate and provide information to a global audience. You know, we have, you know, as the church and as a, as a news organization, you know, we have a responsibility to go and share the good news, to share what's going on in the church, what's going on in the church around the world. And AI really can accelerate that. Now, there are also applications of AI that we can use that might not be positive. In the field of education, there's growing concern that students will resort more and more to AI-generated texts instead of writing their own essays. And you see a lot of opportunity in this. There's also, a, today, even at the conference, there was a discussion, what about plagiarism? What about yeah. um, providing really your own thought and not just artificial intelligence? How do you respond to that? I think, well, it's certainly true, and it, it, you have to change the way you think about pedagogy and education so that you're not um, setting yourself up for failure or temptation so that people respond with, uh, with that type of behavior. How do you think it will impact the church and also the teachings, of, not, not the teachings in its, in its core, but to uh, also bring the teachings out there into the yeah, world? Yeah, there's just, again, a whole new set of tools that we could use for evangelization to, to use this as a resource for people to come in and ask questions and also for us to transmit uh, the information. Um, with a new medium like we did with the printing press. Evangelization can also benefit from artificial intelligence, but how ready is the church for the abilities of this new technology? 
I think the church is ready, but it certainly has a way to go before it's where I would like to see it. I think we need more people who are both deeply technically trained in the sciences and technology, but who also have formal training in ethics, philosophy, and theology to give them that strong moral foundation. So you really also have to know what you're talking about, right? Yes. That's why it's important to have a degree in technology or in, in one of the... Yeah, those. I think that's one of the key challenges for the church. I, we want people who we see as peers. It's not always easy for, you know, Father Michael or, you know, any of the priests to walk into a room and be seen as anyone other than, oh, that priest wants to yeah. enforce his ideas on me. But when they see you as peers, I think it opens up a level of conversation. But there are not only positive aspects to this new technology. Some aspects of AI give reason for pause. I think you have to be careful, you know, applying human judgment. There's AI is, it can seemingly do really magical things, but at the end of the day, it's really just feigning the kind of logic and understanding of the world that we as humans have as part of our minds and, and as part of our just humanity. So how do we use this as Catholics? What are the ethical uses? You know, how can this impact the future of work? These are all questions that need answers, and I think the church has an opportunity to provide this kind of leadership on these questions, regardless of whether or not the church itself is leveraging these tools, because we're all struggling. The new efficiency that AI technologies promise does not only help to reach more people with relevant church teachings and inspire them in their faith, it can also be applied inside the church to carry out daily tasks more effectively. It seems unclear how and when the church will truly benefit from the new possibilities of this technology, but experts agree that the church needs to engage with these developments in order to do what she does best, to advise and to guide. pleasure tonight to be your host. As the 2025 Jubilee of Hope is drawing closer, the EWTN Vatican Bureau hosted its Roman Nights event to explore the rich meaning and enduring importance of Jubilees throughout history. I think it's particularly important. Michael Warsaw, the CEO of EWTN, joined the event to open the evening with reflections on the Jubilee's deep spiritual significance emphasizing the network's commitment to bringing the event's message of hope and renewal to a global audience. It's an important moment in the life of the church, one that doesn't come very often, uh, and, and one that has, I think, the potential to bring profound, profound blessings uh, to the universal church. And An estimated 35 million pilgrims are expected to gather in Rome for the 2025 Jubilee which for many is an opportunity to deepen their union with Christ and strengthen their faith. The Jubilee will officially begin with the opening of the Holy Door of St. Peter's Basilica on Christmas Eve 2024, an act which symbolizes the offering of an extraordinary path towards salvation and invites Christians to make the passage from sin to grace. Earlier this year, the Holy Father called for 2024 to be a year of prayer leading up to the Jubilee. But beyond spiritual preparations for the Jubilee, construction projects are also underway throughout the city of Rome. The Jubilee is marked by the opening of a holy door. We're right at the doorstep, so there's a lot of work that has already been done. You see, looking around Rome, so many construction sites, um, and the work is progressing. The city's getting ready. Historically, biblical jubilee years included the freeing of slaves and prisoners, as well as the forgiveness of debts as manifestations of God's mercy, as called for in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. Pope Boniface VIII re-established the jubilee tradition in 1300 with a Christian focus on the forgiveness of sins and liberation from the punishment due to sin that must be faced in purgatory, 
The Jubilees typically take place once every 25 years, though the Pope can still call for extraordinary Jubilee years more often. It's a, a spiritual pilgrimage. Anita Kadavid, who works at the Regina Apostolorum and organizes immersion programs in Rome for undergraduate students, emphasized that the Jubilee is a timeless opportunity for everyone to rediscover God's mercy. In, in, in this time of polarization and so on, it's an opportunity to deepen our faith and to share our faith with others. Not only discussing and, and, and having big, big moments of um, academic uh, yeah, discussions, but coming together and praying together. I think that for me, that, that, that's the most important thing. And in that way, we, we open our hearts and our souls for the mercy of our Lord, that it's the great opportunity of the Jubilee. After opening the holy door of St. Peter's Basilica, Pope Francis will also open the holy door of the Lateran Basilica, St. Mary Major, and the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. Pilgrims who make a pilgrimage to or walk through a holy door at any of the four papal basilicas in Rome can receive a plenary indulgence under the usual conditions, to be detached from all sins, to pray for the Pope's intentions, to go to confession, and to receive the Holy Eucharist. With Rome bustling with tourists year-round, the Jubilee presents a unique opportunity for visitors and those distant from the faith to deepen their understanding of the Catholic faith. I, I saw an article earlier this week in a very big American daily, which I won't name, but it, 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 it was about the Jubilee, and it said that the Jubilee is a rare Catholic tradition when believers can have their sins forgiven, which is, I, as we were saying, is true as far as it goes. Uh, but Close, uh, but... Yeah, I think, I think it's a teaching opportunity um, because, I mean, you're talking about some 30 million people that are expected, uh, pilgrims, right? Back in 2022, the Dicastery for Evangelization was entrusted with preparing and celebrating the upcoming Jubilee of 2025. The Jubilee year will offer the faithful opportunities to participate in various Jubilee events at the Vatican and in their own dioceses. For pilgrims, tourists, and Roman citizens, it will be a great opportunity to discover the message of the gospel. Uh, a jubilee uh, is focused on receiving mercy, on, on really internalizing this repentance, but as a, as a desire to start a new life. And the indulgence being kind of a, you can think of it as a fresh start, kind of like when you go to confession, um, but a very powerful sign um, through uh, a crossing of the holy door or visiting a holy site, uh, whether in Rome or in other places in the world. As Pope Francis stressed in the papal document, announcing the upcoming Jubilee, we must become singers of hope in a world marked by too much despair. We're in a, in a time where we need hope. We need a light. We need good news. <laughs> we need we need that, so that's, that's kind of the thought behind that. And it, it's, it's meant to bring in each pilgrim to internalize this concept of, of being on a pilgrimage um, and coming to Rome to, again, to encounter this hope that is ultimately in Christ. After a short break, we'll return with a closer look at the Holy See and the Chair of St. Peter, here on Vaticano. For the first time in 150 years, one of the Vatican's most treasured works of art, the historic Chair of St. Peter, has been removed from Bernini's monumental bronze reliquary and placed on display for public veneration. The origins of this wooden throne trace back to the 9th century. According to tradition, it was a gift 
to Pope John VIII in 875 from Charles the Bald, when he traveled to Rome to be crowned Emperor of the Romans. Scholars have studied the chair extensively over the years, revealing that its oldest components date back as far as the 6th century. Revered for centuries, it's known as the Cathedra Sancti Petri. To help us understand the meaning behind this expression, we spoke with a Dominican priest who serves as the Dean of the Faculty of Theology at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum in Rome. The Cathedra is the place where the Pope sits and our faith tells us that on the very same spot would sit St. Peter. Remember that the Pope is also the successor of Christ. Therefore, we want to see in this Cathedra, first and foremost, our spiritual point of reference. This is the place from which the Pope teaches, and in his words, in the perspective of searching for hope and leading us out to full freedom, we want to hear once again the words of Christ himself, but also the teaching of the Church that speaks to us through the ministry of Peter, the ministry of the Pope. Each year on February the 22nd, we celebrate the Feast of the Cathedra Sancti Petri, the Chair of Peter. This wooden throne holds deep spiritual significance, representing a special sign of God's love, a symbol of His desire to gather the entire Church and guide us all along the path to salvation. The wooden seat of St. Peter is far more than just a chair. It's one of the most precious relics treasured by the Vatican and the Church. It is a relic because it gains its value from the faith the people invest in it. Undoubtedly, even if the tradition does not trace it back to the very origins of the papacy, it has been documented and presented in the Vatican since at least the 9th century. It has been the cathedral of many supreme pontiffs, and as such, it possesses its own sanctity. Nevertheless, the chair of St. Peter is much more than a relic itself. It's a symbol, a bridge that brings us to Christ. We never celebrate relics as such. Every relic relates us to Christ. Just as we have relics of martyrs or of saints, they relate us to an identification with Christ, to a perfect identification with Him. We don't celebrate relics, but just worship with them, like in the case of the relics of the martyrs whose lives were completely conformed to Christ. The relic of the wooden throne of St. Peter, a piece of history of inestimable value, is enclosed in a famous sculpted gilt bronze casing, an iconic work of art designed by Gian Lorenzo Bernini and constructed between 1647 and 1653. The very fact that it was placed within that monument gifted to us by Bernini is evidence of a veneration that no other cathedral in the world can claim. This veneration dates back at least 400, nearly 500 years. It can be presumed that it was used as the papal throne until the 1600, that is, until the time it was enclosed within Bernini's monument. This reliquary, shaped like St. Peter's chair, encases the wooden throne and is surrounded by a stunning alabaster depiction of a dove representing the Holy Spirit, alongside sculpted angels and statues of four doctors of the church, Saints Augustine, Ambrose, John Chrysostom, and Athanasius, symbolizing the unity of Christian teaching across East and West. The Cathedra Sancti Petri, a profound symbol of the unbroken line of succession from St. Peter to Pope Francis, was last displayed publicly in 1867 to mark the 1,800th anniversary of St. Peter's martyrdom. On October the 27th, by decision of the Holy Father, the newly restored chair was once again unveiled. Following the concluding mass of the Synod on Synodality, it was prominently placed before the Baldekin. It was the Pope who initiated, desired, and accomplished this because it is undoubtedly one of the symbols of an upcoming special year. A jubilee that aims to restore unity to a church that today is divided with conflicts in Ukraine 
in the Holy Land and among brothers. We need strong symbols, and the cathedra is one of those that are explained and should become symbols of a people on a journey. We must break down these artificial barriers that hinder dialect because if we all start isolating ourselves, we lose that concept of community, which is fundamental to civil life. In 2012, Pope Benedict XVI described the chair as a symbol of the special mission of Peter and his successors to shepherd Christ's flock, keeping it united in faith and charity. Today, pilgrims and visitors can witness this rare piece of history displayed directly in front of the basilica's main altar, above the tomb of St. Peter, where it will remain until December the 8th, the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception.